Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On July 1st of 1913, 50,000 Civil War veterans descended upon Pennsylvania to remember the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Most of these veterans were in their 70s or later, from both sides of the battle. A couple of weeks earlier, June 11th to be precise, a legend was born, and he would help guide, well, a civil war of sorts in football. That man is Vince Lombardi. And although his team was bounced last weekend, and in about a week and a half, we get to see the 55th Super Bowl. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step out the DeLorean, the date is January 15th, 1967, and we are in the Memorial Coliseum in Los Angeles, California. We're here for something that was eh, a small little game between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Green Bay Packers. Well, <laughs> okay, maybe it wasn't that small. Yes, we are here to witness the very first ever Super Bowl. Well, it wasn't really called a Super Bowl back then, but we'll get into that here in this episode. And we almost got to see our rematch of that first one 55 years later. But we'll get to see a different type of history being made, of course, here in about a week and a half. Speaking of history, though, that's why we're here today. We're going to talk a little overview of the history of all of the Super Bowls. Well, not specifically everyone, but kind of like the primary ones throughout the 54 years that have been so far with a partner of the Sports History Network, and that is Tommy Phillips. Now, Tommy, he's been on this show before, but it was mostly to talk about his books, the nifty 90s and the great 80s. About three months ago, he started a project to document every Super Bowl in existence in detail via a podcast. The podcast is, as he would say, Lombardi Memories. Well, that's how he starts off his show every time. He talks about how this is Lombardi Memories, and he has that little announcer voice. But for this episode, we're not going to go into detail of every... <clears throat> We're not going to go into detail of every Super Bowl. We're going to just get an overview arch, and we're going to bring him on to talk about it. Because as I discussed, as we got through this interview, I realized this guy knows so much about everything. And he even said here in the middle, he's like, I wish they had a Super Bowl trivia growing up because I could have aced it. Now, Tommy and I are going to jump right into the interview here in a few minutes. But first, I want to tell you a little about the Sports History Network. We are a group of history content creators striving to build the headquarters for sports yesteryear. And we're always looking to add more partners. And that brings me to you. Do you have an interest to maybe write an article, create a podcast or a YouTube channel or something else where you could share your passion for your team, sport, player, whatever it is about the history of what it is that fuels you? Now, if you do, please reach out to us over on the contact page at the website, which is sportshistorynetwork.com. But now, let's get into the interview with Tommy Phillips. And then, okay, so yeah, Tommy, we just, you and I just stopped off the DeLorean and we went back to January 15th, 1968. This is the day after the second Super Bowl. Now, your Packers in the first one just beat down the Chiefs. And then the second one, they beat down the Raiders. So it wasn't even a close contest. So now these guys, they're kind of thinking, was it a good idea? Should we really have merged these two leagues? I mean, is it just going to make us look even worse? 
is a Super Bowl even worth having? If you could go back to that date and you could talk to these guys and explain to them, yes, the Super Bowl may be worth having, how would you explain it to them? Well, the short answer would be three words, Joe Willie Namath. But <laughs> if there's a uh, longer explanation, it's uh, simply this, that uh, Vince Lombardi's retiring. He is no longer going to be running the Packers. And the difference between the NFL and AFL isn't that the whole two leagues are different caliber. It's simply that the Packers are one of the greatest dynasties of all time. And that once Lombardi has retired, the Packers aren't going to be what they once were. And of course, you know, in present day, it's kind of like whenever Brady left uh, New England. But, um, it, yeah, once, once Lombardi, uh, moves on to retirement, then the NFL is going to be wide open and the AFL can compete with any other team in the NFL. You know, that's kind of a good transition because it is kind of reminiscent of nowadays 2020 where, well, 2021, holy crap, we've already gotten past the 2020 <laughs> season where before then it just seemed like Brady and the Patriots. It's like if they're not going to make it, they're at least in the playoffs and it got almost annoying to the point of less competition and then things got shuffled around. And with that being said, like what, before we dig into this, what's your favorite personal Super Bowl of all time? Well, my favorite is always going to be 45 because the Packers uh, beat the Steelers, and that's my hometown, Pittsburgh. So I was thrilled about that, and it was a very exciting game. If I were to pick, like, my favorite that had nothing to do with the Packers, though, I'd have to go with Super Bowl 38. Uh, part of that <laughs> was because it was – just an amazing Super Bowl party that I was at. It was a whole bunch of high school kids and, and uh, young gra- graduates. Uh, we were, it, it, it was like my last moment with all my friends in, in school before, you know, people moved on. But the game itself was unbelievable. It starts out 0-0 for much of the game. And then finally, there's some scoring before halftime. And then the second half, the floodgates let loose and the Panthers almost pull off the comeback. And uh, the Patriots went on a last second field goal again. Yeah. So at first I didn't actually, I couldn't recall, like I'm, I'm not good at knowing what the numbers are to the specifics, but now that you mentioned Panthers Patriots, sure. I, I do remember that. And uh, as a Lions fan, I can kind of give. What's the best word? Credit, empathy, whatever you want to another team who has not had a chance to actually win the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. But uh, speaking of in the same division, you kind of alluded to it earlier, the Packers. I mean, it just the dominance of the 60s. Uh, let's kind of set the stage for the, the dominance of the Packers moving into the merge and then what was called not the first Super Bowl. Kind of give me what's what was it first called the first game? Well, it, it was just called the NFL championship game from the early 30s until the mid 60s. And the Packers under Lombardi made it to the NFL championship in his second season and they lost to Philadelphia. And then Lombardi said, we're never doing that again. So they went on and won in 1961, 1962. 1965, 1966, 1967, and uh, 63 and 64, uh, they actually, uh, this is a little known fact, but they uh, did play playoff games. It was just the third place playoff game known as the Burt Bell Benefit Bowl. And they won one of those and lost one of those. And, uh, Vince Lombardi said about their play at the Orange Bowl, and Vince Lombardi uh, really ragged on the Orange Bowl on how pathetic it was as a stadium. 
<laughs> that would be where he coached his final game in, with the Packers in Super Bowl II. And then, so you mentioned Super Bowl II. Uh, what was the Super Bowl originally called before they changed that name? Oh, um, yeah, they they called it the AFL NFL World Championship Game. Um, some there's a logo that goes around. Um, it's it's an acronym because uh, that logo that they use for Super Bowl one in all the products and everything, uh, that was never used at the time. So, um, yeah, so, but generally it was called the AFL-NFL championship game, world championship game, and um, it only got its name by kind of accident because Lamar Hunt, the owner of the Chiefs, saw his kids playing with a Super Bowl, the bouncy ball, and... Uh, he blurted out the name Super Bowl and said, well, we can come up with something better than that. But the name stuck, and uh, that that is still the title to this day. Yeah, I mean, it seems when you, you we take it for granted, but Super Bowl seems just fitting for bringing these two different leagues together. And then let's get into that. Let's talk about that transition, you had to convince these people, decision makers, hey, hey, the Super Bowl thing might be okay. Let's get into number three. What happened there? Yeah, well, the New York Jets won the AFL and the Baltimore Colts won the NFL. And the Colts only lost one game and they steamrolled their playoff opponents. It was a ridiculously big Sut out in the championship game, I think 34 nothing, And so they, they went to the Super Bowl and then they were just about 18 point favorites over the Jets, which was, uh, which might even still be, I think it is the uh, biggest point spread in uh, Super Bowl history. But Joe Namath wasn't having any of that. He guaranteed that his team was going to win the Super Bowl. And then they did just that. And uh, the score was only 16-7. to But having watched this game recently, it was total domination by the Jets. And the Colts' touchdown was nothing more than a garbage touchdown late in the game that really didn't mean that it all meant that it wasn't a shutout. So the Jets completely embarrassed the Colts and the NFL. And uh, because of that, they started to start, they, they, excuse me, they, they started to take the AFL more seriously, but not quite yet. Yeah, we'd have to kind of push forward further into the 70s. And that game almost reminded me, now granted it was a high-scoring affair, but recently with your hometown Steelers and the Browns, it's like no one gave the Browns any chance, and then they came out in that first quarter and just dominated. Granted, again, higher-scoring format, but uh let's move yeah. into the 70s and the NFL coming to age, I guess you could say, as America's favorite sport, but let's focus in again on the Super Bowl and the various dynasties that may have been there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well... um so after first at the end of the 60s, uh, the AFL got all of its uh, respect once the Chiefs knocked off the Vikings in Super Bowl four. And then from then on, everyone said, this is a good idea. We better, you know, so they they uh, merged the leagues and then. They sent over Pittsburgh, Baltimore, and Cleveland from the NFL over into the former AFL, which is now the AFC. So uh, that meant that most of the Super Bowls in the 70s were actually all NFL Super Bowls because, you know, Pittsburgh went to four, Baltimore went to one. So that was half of them were former NFL teams who, I mean, the old NFL, 
who were in the Super Bowl and not former AFL team. Uh, but at the beginning of the decade, it was the Cowboys who were on top. Then the Dolphins went undefeated in 1972. They had a dynasty, and they went to three straight Super Bowls, which uh, remains uh, actually only one of three teams to do that. And uh, then Pittsburgh took over, and uh, Dallas came on strong at the end of the decade, but the Steelers won four Super Bowls by the end of the decade. And they were clearly uh, the best team so far of the Super Bowl era. I didn't even think about that as far as, like you said, the reconstruction of the league, even though they were, air quotes, AFC teams, which Mm -hmm. led to you to believe AFL, of course. Yeah, those were NFL teams. So at that point, I'm wondering, inner circles, talking conversations, were they thinking, Okay, sure, AFC's winning, but the NFL is still the dominant league. Was this really worth it and that kind of thing? And would you say that the 70s, it would it be fair to call that the era where football really took off as America's sport, or was it not quite there yet? Oh, I, I think it was actually there uh, before that. I think uh, the day uh, the, the NFL became America's sport was – in 1958 with the greatest game ever played between the Colts and Giants. That's the name everyone's given it. I don't know if it was the greatest game ever played, but uh, the Colts won 23-17 in overtime. And uh, that, and uh, it was seen all across the nation on television. And that's what made the NFL take off. I, I think, uh, there was a Time magazine cover that said football, sport of the 60s. So I would say the NFL came into its own probably in the 60s. And I mean, the, by the 70s, it was, you know, just becoming dominant more like it is now. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't think the 70s were whenever it first became popular. So kind of fair to say that the linchpin moment, like there's been multiple throughout the league, but for transitioning from baseball dominance to football, that December 28th in 1958, and then mm-hmm. from there it just seemed like they never took the pedal off the metal. I mean, sure, in the 80s there was that rife with the strikes and such, but then yeah. it just – I'm 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 biased because I grew up in you know, the, the Barry Sanders era for 90s and all that kind of thing. And, of course, uh, you being a Packers fan, we won't talk about any of that business. But, you know, so I've always only known it as it's the NFL. It's Then it's everybody else is way down here as far as the sports go. Um, you, you alluded to the Pittsburgh Steelers as possibly the greatest easily, or I shouldn't say easily, but the greatest team or dynasty of the Super Bowl era. Um, let's move forward into our timeline because that's what we're all about on this episode. Let's just go a quick timeline of the history of the Super Bowl and take me through the 80s. Let's walk through there. Yes, so the 80s uh, began with the Raiders winning, and then came – uh, Joe Montana and Bill Walsh and the West Coast offense of the San Francisco 49ers. And they won uh, in 81, they won in 84, and then they'd be really, really good by the end of the decade. But in between there, uh, Joe Gibbs, who had taken over as head coach for Washington, he completely changed the team around because like uh, they had John Riggins and Riggins was ready to retire and instead he got Riggins to uh, start playing uh, his brand of football and he went from someone who would have been out of the league to the pro football thing (laughs) so uh, Joe Gibbs got so much out of his quarterbacks Uh, he, he won three Super Bowls with three different well, he won it with three different quarterbacks, but that, that's not entirely true because uh, in Super Bowl 22, the 1987 season, uh, 
Doug Williams won the Super Bowl, but he only started two regular season games. Uh, Jay Schrader started the majority of those games. So, and of course, uh, replacement players also, uh, yeah, replacement players also started three games that year. So, um, yeah, what, what Joe Gibbs did with that team was, was amazing because he essentially had four different starting quarterbacks that he was able to guide to the Super Bowl. And I, I've always thought it was interesting that the two strike years in the NFL, uh, both times Joe Gibbs and Washington won the Super Bowl. Yeah. Like you said, maybe getting, uh, some, uh, player, player, uh, uh, what's it called? Enthusiasm versus just, you know, the X's and O's type of thing. And right there, we're going to stop. We're going to listen to the trailer for Lombardi Memories. It's time for Lombardi Memories, a show that takes you back in time into January or February to the greatest one day spectacle in all of sports. This is the Every Other Tuesday podcast that looks back at each and every one of the 50 plus Super Bowls and tells the story of who won and why. For the fan who needs more than just a box score, this podcast goes drive by drive, play by play through the most dramatic games in history. Every two weeks, we will take a deep dive into a Super Bowl from days past, starting at the first and continuing through 55, maybe beyond, relive all the big plays, record-setting performances, and famous follies. This podcast has several goals, but the most important one is to educate. There's a famous quote that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But what I do know is that we need to learn from those who came before us. Just because we have the highest scoring teams in history in the 2020s doesn't mean we can't learn a thing or two from the 1966 Packers. While this podcast is focused on the Super Bowl era, I will still make a note of celebrating pre-Super Bowl history. Unfortunately, whatever the reason may be, lots of fans like to pretend that the NFL came into existence in 1966. It did not. The NFL has been around since 1920, and three of its teams existed even before that. The Chicago Bears do not just have the one Super Bowl win. They had eight championships before that. I will make sure to bring up what a franchise did before the Super Bowl era if they won any championships before 1966. This podcast will give great attention to detail. How did the teams get down the field to be able to score? What were the big defensive plays that prevented scores? And what were the plays that, if they would have happened differently, could have affected pro football history? Finally, this show has a school theme. Each episode will start with a pop quiz where I ask a trivia question related to the Super Bowl that I'm covering. I will also give homework. It's fun homework, though. I will tell you which books to read that are related to that episode's Super Bowl. These are books that you'll want to check out at the library or buy on Amazon. So join me every two weeks for Lombardi Memories starting on Tuesday, November 3rd. All right, so we're back. That was the trailer from Lombardi Memories with Tommy Phillips. We're going through all the Super Bowls, and this is just a quick little episode, a summary of a different little episode or the Super Bowls. Uh, Tommy, let's talk about we got into the 80s, and I know you have another book. You had the great 80s and the nifty 90s. So in your books, did you cover the Super Bowls in depth, or was it more just a glance over for each era or each year? Oh, the Super Bowls always got the most attention in my books. Uh uh, like, like, I, I mean, most games, I, I'm not going to get down to the nitty gritty because there's a lot of stuff that isn't that interesting, you know, three and out punt, three and out punt. But I try to, whenever I'm talking about the Super Bowls, uh, explain the entire game start to finish so that, um, 
because, you know, it's a historical moment and uh, I want people to know everything about it. I mean, there there was so many questions I used to ask about, well, what happened here? What happened there? And I never knew those answers until I actually watched the games myself. You know, like, for example, a minor thing, but Scott Norwood missed that field goal at the end of Super Bowl 25, but that wasn't actually the final play of the game. So Giants had to come out and Jeff Osterler took a knee and then it was over. But that's one of those things that everyone thinks the game ended on that kick and it actually didn't. So uh, th- it's those little things like that I, I like to touch on because I find them interesting. Yeah. So what's, what's been the approach for, so your podcast is like you said, more in depth, maybe some of the, the nitty gritties of the, of the Super Bowls versus when you had that wide topic of the entire decade, like how has your approach changed for episodes versus the book? Yeah. For the episodes, it's, um, Really quickly going through the seasons of the teams that are in them and then uh, trying to go, you know, drive by drive, mostly play by play. But sometimes, you know, if it's not as interesting, I will uh, skip over some things. But generally speaking, I'm I'm trying to give people the full picture of the Super Bowl and not just the the highlights and um that and i also like to give out awards what ifs those type of things so who's the best player in the losing team or uh what was the biggest play that no one remembers i like to um add all those things in so how far is it super bowl seven that you're on now or is it super bowl eights next uh, Super Bowl Seven comes out on Tuesday, the twenty sixth, I think. Um, yeah, I finished that recently. <laughs> I had an audio problem with it, but I got that fixed. Yeah, that will be coming out on Tuesday, the twenty sixth, which uh, happens to be what anniversary is it? A uh, fourteenth anniversary of the Packers Super Bowl thirty one victory. So. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, and that happens to be one day before this episode releases, so it's almost like we're in that DeLorean going in the future. What, uh, we won't have any spoiler alerts because this episode will be after, but what's the most interesting thing of Super Bowl Seven that kind of struck you that you didn't know before? Um, I think it, it was the complete dominance by the Miami Dolphins. Uh, everyone looks at the score that said 14-7 and thought, well, obviously it was a close game, but it really wasn't. It, it only became a close game because kicker Gerald Premian decided to pick up a blocked kick and try to throw it, and it came out of his hand, and a Washington player grabbed it, went for a touchdown, and... Uh, that made it 14 to 7. Otherwise, the Dolphins probably would have shut them out. Uh, Washington got like one uh, drive down up into Miami territory all day and it got intercepted. So, um, yeah, Dolphins were just a complete powerhouse. <laughs> Although, I have to admit, the game was pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 I mean, the, until the NFL changed the rules for uh, illegal contact and pass interference in 1978, a lot of those early 70s games were real slugfests. Right, yeah, that whole old school cloud in the dust kind of thing. Uh, so you mentioned that if you look at the box score, you would not have thought that the Dolphins had dominated and that. That's kind of true through a lot of things. You know, it's not don't go through the box scores of all the Super Bowls or through the years or whatever it is, and then just automatically assume something because there's those little nuggets inside. And can you can you try to say that kicker's name three times fast? I mean, what was that guy's name? 
Gero Yepremian. Oh my goodness! Like, how did did you have to practice that for the podcast, or did you happen to know it? No, uh, I. It's a very famous Super Bowl story. So, uh, you know, I had as a kid, I'd read all of the old, all these old NFL books, and uh, they told me all the stories of the classic game. And that's how I learned his name and many other names because I, I just, uh, <laughs> we were forced to read a lot and I'm glad we were in, in school. So speaking of that, I mean, let's, we'll, we'll dive in, we'll, we'll flash forward to the nineties later, but you said that as you were a kid, you read a lot of NFL history books. So this has been ingrained from the beginning for you? Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it was it was kind of a thing where um, we'd have library time in school, and, or or they yell at us because we were being too noisy. So they say, "Go get a book." <laughs> so I would always pick all the football books and read those, and so many of them were way out of date, or they were, uh, you know, they they just weren't updated, but. Um, I, I'd read through and I just memorize everything. And, you know, now <laughs> I wish there was a game show I could go on where, uh, they ask Super Bowl questions because man, I could nail all of them. But, uh, yeah, I, I learned a lot from just these old books, the punt pass and kick library, uh, might be familiar to those who collect old books. Those were books out of the 60s and 70s that uh, covered uh, a lot of the really old NFL stuff and some of the uh, contemporary things such as the football in the 60s. So you, from an early age, were into football history. Mm-hmm. As it progressed throughout your life, and then now you're a multiple author. Geez, what do you have? Like five or six books, not all yeah. football or something like that. Yeah. Now? What? Which one did you say was your first one again? Was it the Packers one? Fifty nineties. That was. Oh, which book I wrote? Or yeah, didn't you write? Wasn't it like the Forty ers Packers rivalry was your first one, or was that a different no, one? That was my second one. The Nifty 90s one got updated a couple of times, so it probably doesn't show up as the earliest one. But, um, yeah, the 90s one was my first book. Uh, came kind of weird. I, I had a dream about it. I had a dream where I was like, wouldn't it be great if someone wrote a book on the 90s in sports? And, and then I woke up and I had to type it into my phone so I wouldn't forget it. And then, um, everything kind of just sprouted from there. Yeah, and that kind of is one of those. As a as a host, you're kind of I'm sitting there licking my chops because that's a good transition into. Now we got to talk about the Super Bowl era of the 1990s. Let's get into that. I did see one note too that you left me. It said Jerry Jones helps the 49ers. What's that all about? <laughs> well, uh, after Super Bowl 28, the Cowboys have won two straight Super Bowls completely dominated. They were on their way to becoming just one of the biggest uh, juggernauts of all time. And then Jerry Jones and Jimmy Johnson got into a fight over who's who was responsible for it. And, uh, and I've, I've heard this story from many people, basically that, you know, that Jerry Jones from, from, uh, in fact, I've, I've read about sports writers who were around whenever Jerry Jones was kind of like, I could win with anybody. So he decides to fire, well, maybe not fire Jimmy Johnson, but they, you know, parted ways. And then Barry Switzer takes over and, uh, Barry Switzer did win a Super Bowl, but, um, it, if Jimmy Johnson was still head coach, I I really believe the Cowboys would have won Super Bowl 29 over the Chargers and 
Ben still won Super Bowl 30, and who who knows how many more he would have won. Uh, it, it's it's kind of a tragedy if you're a Cowboys fan, but I mean, all the rest of us are kind of glad that never happened. But I <laughs> I truly believe that if Jimmy Johnson had not been forced out, that the Cowboys would have been the greatest dynasty of all time. Yeah, and as a non-Cowboys fan, I, I'm glad that that happened as well. I mean, yeah. it's one of those things where recently, last year, you know, when Jimmy got, fortunately, they didn't get to the enshrinement, but the Hall of Fame <laughs> recognition and everything. And, right, right. You know, the whole, I, I was actually wondering, too, if part of that was going to be the whole, didn't Deion Sanders, like, go back and forth between the two teams and win a Super Bowl, then win another one with the other team the next year? Yeah, yeah, he joined the 49ers and won in 94 and then joined the Cowboys with after a very contentious uh contract the uh negotiation and he finally signed and then he won the Super Bowl in 1995 with the Cowboys. The 1996, that's one that matters to you too, right? As a, uh, as a Packers yeah. fan, or was it 98? Yeah, well, see, the, the Packers, uh, became a juggernaut once, um, which didn't make much sense, but it was once Sterling Sarp re- retired due to injury. At that point, the Brett Ford just, took another step, and then he won three straight MVPs. The Packers went to two Super Bowls. They won one of them. The other one, well, it was kind of disappointing. But um, And then John Elway showed up, and uh, John Elway, like no one had heard from this guy since the 80s. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding, though. Uh, but John Elway hadn't been to a Super Bowl since the 80s, and he ended up leading the Broncos to become a dynasty in their own right, and they beat the Packers and then won an easier Super Bowl against Atlanta. And that way went out on top, and the Broncos franchise cratered after that. Um, and and really, the, the weird thing about talking about the 90s is that the last year of the 90s may have been the most exciting, and it but it just doesn't fit into the uh, puzzle, if you will, of the rest of the decade because uh, the Rams and Titans, they, they hadn't been even a playoff team for almost the entire decade, and they ended up playing in the final Super Bowl of the decade. Yeah, and we're talking about, like you said, maybe two teams that came out of nowhere, but one of the most memorable Super Bowls slash Super Bowl moments with that reaching for that, which is what was it, one yard or two yards away or whatever for my lifetime, that is. Yeah. And um, it was hard to not like the greatest show on turf as a, as a young football fan and getting into fantasy football at that time. That was another reason probably why people liked it so much with the Marshall Falk breaking records and just the greatest show on turf again. And, but then they, they got stopped not too long after that. Let's get into the next decade a little bit and let's talk about what as a Lions fan and a non Patriots fan, I'm not too fond of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the Patriots, uh, well, Drew Bledsoe got hurt. Tom Brady had to take over and the rest is history. And the Patriots won three out of four Super Bowls in the early part of the 2000s. And um, one of those came at the expense of the Rams, who everyone thought was going to become. Um, they thought they that the Rams were going to be a dynasty. Instead, the Patriots became one. And then uh, in in the latter part of the decade, Ben Roethlisberger came to Pittsburgh. Peyton Manning finally found a way to break through in the playoffs. And uh, there was this uh, kind of interesting uh, 
like rotation. It was a rotation between the Patriots, the Steelers, and the Colts. And uh, one of those three teams won all but one conference championship in that um, decade. They just kept on going back and forth between each other. It was going to be one of those teams, and that's obviously because they all had Hall of Fame quarterbacks. Yeah, I mean, that makes a big difference. At the very beginning of it was probably one of my – that was when I became a Ravens fan, that 2001 against the Giants, because I – so that was when I was really getting into football for high school, and that would have been my position, and Ray Lewis and the organized chaos defense. And I've talked about that on this show before. Mm-hmm. So I that's my AFC team, and it kind of has been ever since. I think I kind of stepped away a little bit since the whole Ray Lewis era is kind of, you know, and then Ed Reed era has gone too. Not that they're not a great defense uh, yeah. oftentimes, but I just kind of stepped away from it. And I, I would say that fantasy football probably played a factor into that too. Like the loyalties are less, like we're not as allegiant to our, I'm, I'm the Lions, of course, is going to always be, but they, never do anything for me and then you know so it's like i find myself watching players of teams versus being allegiant to the teams themselves and one super bowl that will never ever leave my one play two plays whatever from that super bowl that eli manning with the patriots and the the little dog versus the big dog i mean that can you sit there and remember that yourself like where you were and everything that play oh i absolutely remember it uh <laughs> Good reasons and bad because the bad the bad reasons were my medicine wasn't working right. I had an awful headache. Um, I was in so much pain. But um, but I'm at a Super Bowl party and I I pointed out this and people people still don't catch on that Troy Aikman announcing he says the word job on almost every single play. And if you listen for that word job, you're going to start hearing it. And everyone was laughing because I kept on pointing out every time he said the word job. Well, then the David Tyree play happens. And (laughs) so Eli Manning makes that fantastic escape, throws it, Tyree catches it barely, and then... Troy Aikman says, great job by David Tyree. And <laughs> everyone was laughing. And everyone, of course, was cheering against the Patriots. So everyone was excited whenever the Giants went down and scored and won that game. And uh, and prevented the rest of us from having to hear about 19-0 for the rest of our lives. Right, exactly. I mean, instead we get to hear about 72 for the rest of our lives and yeah. how that'll never be, they'll never be as good as them and all that kind of thing. And, uh, I, you mentioned, like, like you said, Eli, and often that goes amongst many people. The, the Tyree catch, you like, everybody knows that and then ripping over Harrison and barely hanging on, but that was a Houdini effect in itself, but it should never have been. Like that that was poor tackling from the Patriots side and he should have never escaped that that uh sack yeah. from the from the get go as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean he did it again. I mean that Manningham on the sidelines and what was it what was it, two thousand ten or eleven was that second one that they Yeah, twenty eleven, uh Super Bowl forty six yeah uh, Manningham caught that touchdown on the far sideline. And, or not a touchdown, I'm sorry. Um, he caught that long pass on the long, on the sideline, which, uh, set up the touchdown that they didn't want to score. And, um, uh, so Ahmad Bradshaw kind of falls into the end zone by accident because the Giants wanted to just run out the clock and kick a field goal while the Patriots wanted to let them score so they get time left. So um, after all that, the Patriots got in range for a Hail Mary, but Tom Brady not as good as Hail Mary as Aaron Rodgers. So uh, that fell incomplete, and the Giants won again. You know, I don't 
this is a as a highlighter. I'm going to pretend this is a dagger. I'm putting it right through the back of my rib cage right now because you mentioned Rodgers and Hail Marys. Uh-huh. And I was at Buffalo Wild Wings when he threw it to – was it the tight end? Was it Richard Rodgers at the time? Yeah. Or what was, yeah. Yeah. And I thought I'm the only Lions fan in the, the building, right? And I'm walking out thinking we're great, and I had to stop to watch the play. And then, of course – had to walk through all of the sea of Packers with my Lions jersey on right after that moment. After. I think it was, it was either Monday night or Thursday night. I remember I had to go to work the next day. It was one of those two. Yeah. Yeah, so we won't bring that up anymore. But we can talk about the Packers and the Steelers game, if you wish, a little bit, that yeah. that Super Bowl. So go ahead. Let's chug along into the 2010s a little bit. Yeah, so the Packers uh... – Somehow made it to the Super Bowl as a number six seed. Um, they were only the second number six seed to uh, make, make it to a Super Bowl. And uh, they went up against the Steelers. People had thought it would be the Patriots, but they got upset by the Jets. So then the Steelers made it in. And the pa- Packers and Steelers did exactly what they do all the time. The Packers got off to a big lead. Steelers got behind and came back, and uh, the game followed that script perfectly until the Packers' defense somehow made a stop and won the game. And uh, really, that was the beginning of the end for Pittsburgh because uh, the Steelers have not been very good ever since, and lots of fans and media around here are uh pretty disgusted with how things have gone for the rest of the decade. But the Packers, they haven't been back to the Super Bowl yet either, so we'll see if they make it. And who emerged in this decade was, well, the Patriots again. They came back and became another dynasty, uh, just as the Seahawks, uh, their run came to an end. The Seahawks would have been a dynasty if they just would have run the ball on the one yard line. And, <laughs> and, and I know how all the analytics people say that passing was the smart play. You know what? I, I, I don't believe that for a second. The Seahawks blew it. And if they had that touchdown there, we would be talking about the Seattle Seahawks as the team of the 2010s. Instead, it was the Patriots again. <laughs> the Patriots were the team of the decade for a second straight decade. And uh, they won three out of five Super Bowls. They matched Miami with three Super Bowl appearances in a row. And they had uh, a pass in Super Bowl 52 that could have potentially tied the game if it was caught in a two-point conversion, but that didn't work out. So the Patriots, uh, they became a dynasty again. And then at the very end, we have this new, new kid on the block. That's Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. And now we see if he can turn them into a dynasty. Yeah, it's almost like we come full circle from the very beginning in Super Bowl One, even though it wasn't called that. And uh, what's your chances that you think it might become a, a Super Bowl One rematch this year? I put it at fifty-fifty. Yeah. Yeah, that seems like you know not a very good analysis. Like you're just gonna you're gonna have a <laughs> cop out there, is what they call it. <laughs> well, no, I, I. Well, what I'm basically saying is I'm. I'm giving, if you multiply the percent chance that Green Bay wins and the percent chance that Kansas City wins, it comes to about 50%. So uh, both teams should win, but uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go out on record right here and officially announce that, yes, I, I'm rooting for the Packers, but only because... 
Tom Brady. Otherwise, I would root for the Bucks, hands down. And Ndamukin Sue, being a former Lions, of course, I'd like to see him get a chance to actually win the Super Bowl. Um, I am having a hard time. I'm probably going to root for the Bills just because of, as a Lions fan, you have to root for that type of a team. But I'd also, as a history fan and a, a guy who owns the Sports History Network, I would like to see a rematch of Super Bowl One, so everybody for two yeah. weeks talks about mm-hmm. Super Bowl One, and maybe they go and they check out your first episode of Lombardi Memories. And let's just kind of leave it with that. Throughout your podcast research so far, what's the one interesting golden nugget that you just kind of blew you away that you never knew before? Um. <laughs> it's it's not really on the football field, but it's the fact that we have Canada to thank for the fact that Super Bowl Four still has a surviving broadcast. Because up in Canada, they simulcast um, CBS's broadcast of Super Bowl Four, and um, they preserve that, whereas CBS just taped right over the Super Bowl thinking it, no one would ever care to see that again. So that uh, Canadian television station, whatever they were, that broadcast the Super or simulcast the Super Bowl off CBS's feed, they have made it so that you can still go and watch Super Bowl IV um, in black and white, that's the only way you can see it, but the broadcast has been preserved that way, otherwise it'd be lost to posterity. Man, I yeah, that that is an interesting nugget that no one would have ever really realized. I mean, again, not even – how could you – we're going to go back to the very first question that we asked then. How could someone even think that – you would not want to save this for, for that long. You know, it's just crazy to think that you would tape over something like a Super Bowl. But, hey, there must have been their reasons. And let's go back in the DeLorean and giving you the virtual keys, right? Mm-hmm. You can go back to any Super Bowl that we did not bring up. Mm-hmm. And you can relive that moment and you could be a part of the moment. Which one would it be? Oh, uh, man. Um uh... I I would I would go back to Super Bowl twenty five between the Bills and the Giants. Uh we, we kind of touched on that, but um that that game was the ultimate chess match. You had one team, no huddle, hurry up offense, uh, just passing it down the field, and then you had the other team running the football, running out the clock on almost and uh they, their goal, Giants' goal was to run out the clock from the very first second of the game. And to see the Giants have that style against the Bills and their no huddle style, that's one of those, uh, opposites type of games that you rarely get to see. Well, there you go. A little Super Bowl history. If you want more of an in-depth recollection of each Super Bowl, then I highly suggest that you head over to Tommy's podcast called Lombardi Memories. And speaking of something, uh, backstage pass kind of, if you will, as a Lions fan, well, it's kind of fun to pick and poke at Tommy after last weekend. But then again, as a uh, founder of Sports History Network and a Football History Podcast, I was kind of rooting for that rematch of Super Bowl one. But with that, I'll tell you... We got a lot more coming up for you. And if you want to join again, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com. We'll make sure we get in touch with you. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to the footballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes. Where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? 
it's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.